Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, latest RTPI London's webinar. Um, today, we're going to focus on career stories. Uh, my name is Katie Liddington. I am an environmental planner at Wood. Um, I'm, on the, I'm a member of the RTPI London uh, Regional Management Board, and I'm today's chair. Um, Unfortunately, one of our speakers um, is unable to attend today due to an illness, um, but we have three really great speakers um, to talk about their careers. Um, so I still think it's going to be a very interesting um, conversation. And we've got a Q&A session at the end, um, so please feel free to send through your um, questions in the chat function. Um, we've also added um, Ginny and Sam's presentations. And the RTPI have also um, developed an investing in volunteering strategy, um, which has been added to the attendee handout section um, on the right hand panel of um, the webinar today. Uh, make sure you download those while you can, because I don't think you can go back in and get them afterwards. Um, but hopefully there's some really good information in there. There's also an RTPI um, YouTube video about the investing in volunteering strategy. Um, okay, so our first speaker today is Sam Stafford. Um, Sam is a chartered town planner. Um, he has been since 2002 and is a member of the RTPI's England Policy Panel. Um, the majority of Sam's career has been in consultancy, but for the last five years, he has worked for Barrett Developments as a regional strategic land director. Uh, many of you may know Sam as the voice behind the Fifty Shades of Planning blog, um, which he started back in 2012 um, and has recently been turned into a podcast. Um, over to you, Sam. Hi, can you hear me okay? You'll be able to tell me if you uh, will be able to tell me if you couldn't. Um, sorry, I'm just looking with my uh, connection a little bit. I've got two little boys. I, I advise them not to be playing Fortnite um, between half past twelve and half past one. But I suspect that that temptation has proved too uh, has proved too much for them, and that is having an influence. <laughs> we can hear you sir. on my uh, on my connection. Um, thank you, Katie. Um, thanks to the uh, RTPI London for this um, uh, for this opportunity opportunity to, to talk to you. I think it came about because um, Tom Venables had seen um, uh, a piece that I'd written um, and I posted it on my um, on my Fifty Shades of uh, Planning blog um, whilst on furlough leave, which was the last uh, last significant uh, or most recent significant experience of, uh, of, of my career. Um, and some of the things that I'll talk about, uh, you'll be able to, uh, to, 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 to read about in that blog post, um, Fifty Shades of Planning blog, if, uh, if anybody wants to, uh, to Google it, you'll find it there. Um, but the other thing that I did whilst on furlough leave, I did a lot of, apart from making the odd, the odd podcast, um, was to make Spotify playlists. So I thought that um, as a theme, I would, uh, I would talk around a Spotify playlist that I've made of songs that speak to experiences um, that I've had uh, and lessons learned through my career. So you'll find it, uh, you will actually find it on the, on Spotify. Uh, should you so desire, broaden your um, musical tastes uh, aligned with my, um, uh, my, my, uh, my middle age, uh, my middle age playlist. Um, so I'm going to talk you through ten tunes that um, uh, that that, uh, that speak to me and that uh, speak to some of the experiences uh, and, and lessons, as I say, that, um, that I've had. Um, number one, um, an absolute banger um, from the music from back in the um, from back in the day. Um, I was uh, I was at a conference in the deepest, darkest depths of the uh, the 2008 recession. Uh, and I pitched myself as a as a, a heritage specialist with an attempt to uh, make myself useful at the consultancy that I was working for at that time. And um, I remember the, the the speakers at this at, a, at this heritage conference in um, in Liverpool had gathered and were uh, just chatting between ourselves before the conference started. And there's an older gentleman, and uh, we were just chewing the fat about the economic news and. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the air of uh, the whiff of redundancies in the air, and this this nice old chap, he said, "Well, of course, um, you can expect to work through four recessions in in your in in your career. This will be my fourth." And he was he was heading to retirement, and that that's something that I hadn't thought about. I started working in two thousand, and that 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 scope that, that 
scale of a career as a as a 40 year endeavor was not not something that I'd given much thought to having every job that I'd applied for um, up to that point but that certainly then thinking about it in those terms helped me put things and that 2008-9 experience in particular and this experience has furloughed further leave brought back memories of brought back memories of that it, it helped to put a career in that you know in that, that the longevity of that into some kind of um, um, perspective because it, it seems to me a career is a bit like climbing the mountain you know it's it's it, it's 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 hard at times. You have to pause for breath and take stock, but the rewards start to come the higher up that you go, and um, as, as the as the weight in the legs start to um, as, as the weight in the legs you start to feel um, feel a little bit more. Now, of course, that's that's not for um, for everybody, and you know, it may, not everybody gets to the top, but it's the top of the mountain. That forty years, but I've got a huge amount of respect now, more than I did when I started. For people who do manage to um, do manage to see it all the way through. I'm, I'm hopefully having a chat with, uh, on the podcast in the next few weeks or for the podcast um, with um, with a planner who's just retired after 42 years and he spent 26 of those at Salford City Council, a guy called Chris Finlay. And I'm really looking forward to having a um, having a chat um, a chat with Chris about uh, about just that you know 40 year endeavour. So that, that's the, that's the that's the first point I'd make to, to see it in to see all these ups and downs in that. Trials and tribulations in that um, in that context. Um, number two, this is um, off a, a new release from possibly my favourite band of all time. Um, they've released some recordings uh, as a second album um, that they made when the, the Waterfall One came out in 2014. Climbing the ladder. There's a line in here about um, paying your dues, and um, that is what the early the early part of your career, I think, is is largely uh, is largely about. Um, I was given a piece of advice at university on in my final year on the career development and orientation module about uh, doing f um, five jobs over ten years in different parts of the sector. A couple of years there, a couple of years there, which I started off with the, um, with the intention of doing. And of course, as I said before, I, I'd, I'd got every job that I'd applied for up to um, up to the 2009 um, recession. Things were going to plan now, whether or not you know, that's clearly not sustainable. Your destiny is never in your own hands, which is a point I'll come back to. But um, that sense of, of, of seeking out um, experience is one that I really benefited from. And I think that is sound advice, noting that you can't always um, pick and choose the uh, the things that you want to do, which I'll come back to. But the idea of um, accruing knowledge, accruing experiences in that first phase of your career, seeing seeing the breadth of the profession, um, taking in um, taking in um, issues from other people's perspectives, um, focusing less on promotions and job titles as people kind of jostle for position early on. Um, and really soaking up as much information as you um, as you as you can. I really benefited from that, and I think that's um, I think that that is um, that sound advice. Um, this is a little um, trite and a little platitudinous um, in in my experience. Um, you you can't get it if you really want because. Um, you know, your destiny is not always entirely in your um, in your own hands. But I do certainly subscribe to the theory um, that the harder you practice, the luckier you get. Um, which I think Gary Player, the golfer, is, um, is famous for um, is for saying. I mean, nobody can get anything if you really want it. All you can do is just make the best decision that you can when a fork in the road appears. In my experience, um, but you're more likely to get more decision, uh, uh, more forks in the road appearing to you, the harder you, the harder you work, the more experiences you, uh, you seek out, um, the more people you, you seek out. I've always found that the, um, the best way of, 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 of getting promoted, for example, is to, um, is to do the job that you want already. Um, I found the best roles that I've had have made themselves available, have, have been made aware to me, have had a tap on the shoulder rather than applying for them. And um, you work as hard as you can to make those experiences uh, or those opportunities um, 
emerge. So I wouldn't necessarily say you can get it if you really want, but I would say that the harder you work, as Gary Player said, the, the luckier you get. But at the same time, Or, or um, at the same time, there is something seductive about ambition, but there's also something unrequited about it. Um, there's a great line in this this tune. Um, a good friend of mine put me into um, got me into King Creosote a little while ago, um, and uh, and he actually has um, uh, he's just been made redundant. He was a director at a major planning consultancy, and he was made redundant on um, on Wednesday. There's a great line in this tune. Um, um, back in my mind, I was always hoping that I might just get by. And on one hand, yes, push and work hard and you know seek out opportunity. But the, on the other hand, just getting by is actually um, quite uh, you know quite an achievement. I um, I was made redundant once. I was invited to leave um, another job, and when it happens, it is incredibly disconcerting. But at the same time, um, as I've said to my my friend this week, you strip your direct debits right back, you strip your standing orders right back, you just focus on covering the mortgage, um, and you get by. It's um, it's doable. Other people have done it. You can do it. Um, sometimes getting by is actually um, a success in itself. This is a great tune. Um, Fund, uh, there's, a, there's a line in it: um, "The years go by as quickly as you blink," which is absolutely, uh, which is absolutely true. Um, you work for, you know, five days of a seven-day week, and if you don't enjoy what you do, then that is an awful lot of your, uh, a, lot, a very large portion of your your waking hours um, uh, attributed being attributed to something that you're you're not enjoying you know life is too short to find yourself not wanting to get up and go to go to work in the morning so whatever it is that you you do do um you have to you have to enjoy it um on a more practical uh, uh, on a more practical level um I, I want to say often that there are there are two kinds of people and two kinds of people in the world um if somebody's given a task, whatever that task may be, there's two kinds of people in the world. The first person will look to how it's been done previously and look to replicate that for the sake of ease or speed. And that might seem like the best way of, say, if you're a consultant, transacting that job as quickly and efficiently as, um, as, as possible. Um, the danger there, of course, is that you don't change the header and the footer and you send something somebody to somebody that's clearly just been cut and pasted from, from somewhere else, which is an absolute golden rule for me if I'm uh, when I'm working with consultants. That's, um, that is an absolute no-no. But it's emblematic and symptomatic of that kind of lazy attitude. The other person will look at the best way of doing that, the best way of doing that particular task, which might be informed by how it's been done previously, but think afresh, think of the best way of doing it. Now that might, if you're a consultant, that might take longer than the other way, and therefore you're not transacting it as, uh, as cost effectively as, as, as otherwise. But doing it differently will show that uh, will show the client in that example um, that you're thinking uh, you're thinking of fresh, you're thinking about their specific problem, uh, that specific project. But more importantly, it develops thinking. And I would always try to be the person who thinks about doing something the best way possible rather than the easiest way possible. I needed to get um, to find a way of shoehorning this tune in because it's um, one of my favourite songs and one of my favourite albums by one of my favourite bands. Um, there are two other kinds of people um, in this world. This was um, some uh, some guy I worked with just at the minute as um, one of his uh, one of his favourite sayings. Um, you can either um, people two two kinds of people. Some either radiate um, energy and some people absorb that energy. And you know, some people can't help it. That's just who they. That's that's just their nature. But you want to be around people who radiate positive, um, positive energy. Who, um, so for example, if, if um, most of my experience has been in planning consultancy, it was once said to me, the best planning consultants don't necessarily know the most about planning. 
there is a there is a positive positivity to them a charm a charisma they're in the service industry but if you're somebody that people want to want to be around radiate to and um that is uh, i think that is uh, that is wise counsel bit of bob dylan um there's always a boss you've got to serve somebody and um, that ultimately is a fact of life and um, i've had some good bosses i've had some less good bosses and you try to learn from everybody and take that into your own managerial style but ultimately you're you're working for somebody um because of that because you get some good bosses and some bad bosses i find and i try to work for my own sense of self-satisfaction set your own standards and 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 work to them i think that's an important lesson that um, um that i've learned um but you strike a balance and the close and if you want to have ultimately more control over your destiny um then you do it for yourself and i've got a lot of time and a lot of respect for people who do manage to stick at a career for 40 years but i'm also holding very high esteem those people who cast off the corporate shackles and that corporate serfdom and say do you know what i'm going to go out there and i'm going to put the destiny in my own hands and i'm going to do it for i'm going to do it my way and i'm going to do it for, for my clients i'm going to do what i want to do um still got to get that work in of course but you're putting the de your destiny um closer to your own hands um and the friend who um, i mentioned before he's registered as self-employed this week he's going to start his own business and he's going to do his own thing and um you know fair play to um fair play to him i hope he looks back on on this as um you know as a, as a significant um as a significant milestone um you know not a not a worry it's um it's an opportunity uh, i've got a couple more um a planner and a slave to my verbosity um this is a um this is a banger i wanted to get uh, i wanted to get this in because um for a couple of reasons um us be them us be them it speaks to the kind of the, the conflict that's almost inherent within the planning system um it's almost set up to be um confrontational you uh, you win the planning battle um you know planners at war nimbies at war um you know it it doesn't need to be um it doesn't need to be that way um and the other reason i wanted to get this in is because of um, a sense that i've detected over time um you know, there is still i think i think i think the apprentice has got a, a lot to answer for on this this sense that that that, that life in, in general let alone planning is a is a zero-sum game that you can't win unless somebody else loses well i'm i'm not convinced about that and i think it's probably a new and a, a newer generation of planners managers and people who are perhaps um wanting to wanting to turn that kind of old corporate kind of attitude um on its head it doesn't have to be that way it's not a zero-sum game um with compromise and collaboration and cooperation um, you know, ev ev everybody can win you can achieve what you want to achieve more quickly more easily um, by making more friends along the way by by just doing the by doing the right thing not what might some people you know higher up the food chain might perceive to be the right thing i hope that makes sense it makes sense in my uh, it makes sense in my head um and finally any any talk of mine any talk about um uh you know, career, work, um, uh, life in general has to include um, has to include this uh, has to include this tune. Um, the Buddha's Golden Path, the classic introduction to Zen Buddhism, was a 1929 book by the American author Dwight Goddard. Um, I'm, I'm, I've got no book on Zen. I'm, 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 I've got no means an expert on this, but I. I do think that adopting a, uh, a Zen-like state of tranquility to the world of work helps sometimes. I mean, ultimately, um, like I said before, your destiny is, as I've discovered on a couple of occasions, your destiny is never in your own hands. I was invited to leave one role with no notice at all. I got back from lunch and uh, was invited to clear my desk and, and, and that was that. Um, you know, expect the unexpected is um, is is, a, is wise counsel in that in in that regard. Um, I adopt. I try to adopt a um, 
yeah, a, a zen-like state um, whereby I, you care intensely about what it is that you do and what it is that you are doing, but at the same time, don't care at all. If you can hold those two thoughts in your head at the same time, having a career can. I wrote in the a piece just to wrap up. I wrote in the piece that I wrote on the um, on the blog. Um, a career can no more be planned as a town can be planned. Life cannot be planned. Aspirations and guiding principles are about to secure a platform as you can hope for a master plan, if you will, that is flexible enough to deal with changing circumstances and that allows the fine grain to sort itself out. Um, that's probably the the best advice that I can offer um i mentioned uh, i mentioned my podcast you'll find it a bit of a plug um on um, um itunes on spotify wherever you get your podcasts um please get involved in that and uh, and if you listen and if you've got any ideas or any comments on that um you'll find me on um you'll find me on twitter um, i think that's about 10 or 15 minutes that's all i have to say thank you Thanks, Sam. That was um, really insightful. And um, I, I feel like that will have resonated with a lot of people, particularly myself. Um, you know, you can spend a lot of time and waste a lot of energy trying to compare yourself to others. And you have to kind of take a step back and remind yourself that you are on your own individual career path and it will change at various different ways. Um, and and I, I agree with what you say. You're learning from everything, um, the positives and the negatives, um, everything kind of comes together eventually in the end. And um, I, I was um, just starting out at the very start of the um, the last recession in 2008. I was um, in a job for four years with no promotion and no pay rise and lucky that I still had a job, I guess, and thankful for that. Um, and, and I guess it was really easy to compare yourself to other people and see other people progressing. Um, but the, the thing I always tell my team at work is um, it all kind of equals itself out eventually. Um, if something takes you longer at one point in your life, it'll happen quicker. The next stage might happen quicker at the next stage. Um, so I found that really interesting. Um, thank you. That was really good. And hopefully our listeners will have um, taken some inspiration from that. Um, OK, our second speaker is Ginny Jukes. Um, Ginny is a chartered um, planner with over 12 years experience. Um, during her career, she has navigated the 2008 economic downturn. She took an 18 month career break and a career change. Um, so she's got lots to talk about. <laughs> um, she's going to talk about how she has taught herself to look for opportunities along the way um, and especially how to navigate that career change, I guess. Um, thank you, Ginny. Thank you, Katie. Um, and thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in this afternoon. Uh, and thank you also to the RTPI for giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you today. As Katie said, I'm a chartered town planner, um, but I also work for St George um, PLC as their development manager. So St George, they're a developer and part of the Barclay Group. Uh, but I'm not here today to talk to you about my role with them. I'm actually here, as the webinar, the title of the webinar suggests, to to give you a summary of my career story. So I have had some highs, but I have also had some lows as well. And we we are in unprecedented times at the moment. Everyone agrees, and challenging times as well. So I hope that by sharing my experiences of those more challenging times, that there is something that everyone can take away which will help them navigate this, these strange times that we're in. So as with any good story, we start at the beginning. And in terms of my career, when I first attended university, I I didn't actually want to become a town planner. I shouldn't be saying this, should I? Um, I actually studied international business and Spanish at Liverpool John Moores University. It's a four year course um, and a year of that was spent living, working, studying in Spain at Salamanca University and then in Barcelona. And after spending those four years at university and graduating, I then found myself wandering, wandering a little aimlessly through the jobs market, didn't really know what to do. I had a number of jobs working mainly in sales and marketing. And after about three years of doing that, I found myself being made redundant. 
And so as you do at times like that, you dust yourself down, you pick yourself up and say, right, OK, let's let's find another job. And so I started applying for jobs and I realised actually that I didn't want any of the jobs that I was applying for. And I thought that's a really sorry state of affairs because we spend the majority of our life working and the majority of our week, as Sam was saying, working. So you should find something that you want to do. As my dad always says, if you find a job you love, then you never work a day's life, work a day in your life. So I took a bit of time and thought about what I wanted to do. I made a, did a lot of research, a lot of reading. And at the end of, it was a few months that I took, at the end of that period, I actually thought I wanted to be a surveyor. So a friend of mine who was working at what was then known as GVA Grimley, but is now known as Averson Young, uh, he was working in the Birmingham office and he very kindly said, OK, well, let's organise two weeks of work experience for you to come in because I wanted to understand what a surveyor does every day. Uh, you can read a job description, but that doesn't really tell you really what you're doing, which is what I wanted to find out. So they organised the two weeks of work experience. I went in and I spent a few days in various different departments. And I also spent two days in the planning department. And that was it. I knew what I wanted to do. I was super excited about planning. And so Avison Young very kindly said, if you can get yourself onto an accredited course, then we will let you join our graduate scheme. So I managed to secure a place on the MSc Spatial Planning at Oxford Brooks and fast forward five years from that point and I was a fully chartered town planner. It took a heck of a lot of hard work. I did two years part-time study whilst working full-time at Aberson Young um, and then I went through my APC process as well which is also hard work as which some of you might know already and I got there in the end, I was fully chartered and I had a job as well, which was fantastic. And then the downturn hit and redundancies were being made left, right and centre. And I was just one of the many people that was made redundant. And it's it's hard when that happens. It's really hard, especially if you're if you're not expecting it. And a downturn can happen really quickly. And so it can feel like a bit of a shock. But anyway, as I said, I dusted myself down and I picked myself up and I thought, OK, well, let's let's do some job hunting. And it's tough job hunting in a market where there aren't any jobs and the competition is high. I'm not going to lie. It's super tough, but you've just got to try. But at that point in time, another opportunity came along that I just couldn't resist. And that was an opportunity with VSO. And for those who aren't familiar with VSO, VSO stands for Voluntary Service Overseas and they are an NGO and they support uh, countries who are very challenged. So that's typically in Africa, parts of Asia, parts of South America as well. And instead of sending money, which can be misspent, they send people instead to help upskill, which they consider to be a more sustainable way of, of helping people. VSO had set up a town planning program with the government of Zambia because the government were looking to update their planning system. Believe it or not, their planning system was based on the Town and Country Planning Act 1947 and they hadn't updated anything since then. So they were a little behind on what they needed to do. So I applied for one of the placements. Uh, it was probably one of the most rigorous and testing application processes I've been through, but I managed to secure a place. And so I was then dispatched out to go and work for Kazangula District Council. And there's a photograph of some of my colleagues there in front of the building. And I was located in Livingston in Zambia which is right next to the Victoria Falls. So that was a, a wonderful coincidence. And a, and a fun geographical fact for you is that uh, Kazangula, where I was based, is one of the few places in the world where four countries meet. So I put it on the, on the map on the inset. So you have Zambia, Namibia, Botswana and Zimbabwe all meeting in one point. 
So I spent two years working in Africa, which was fantastic. During that time, to try and keep abreast with what was happening in England, I was volunteering with Planning Aid and I also did whatever else I could. So, for example, that was participating in and listening in to the World Town Planning Conference that I was able to do remotely. So my time in Africa came to an end and I returned back to the UK and found myself in a position where I was job hunting again. And so I thought, right, I've been out of the, the game in terms of work to, working in England probably for about three years now. And whilst I have been doing town planning work, it's not the very traditional roles that we have here in England. And so I felt that in some ways I was actually at a bit of a disadvantage when I was competing against other candidates for roles. And there were roles around, but not a huge number. So what I did to try and strengthen my position, I did a number of things. So at the time, the planning summer school was being held. And so I contacted the organisers of that event uh, and said that I would like to come along because it was a great opportunity to catch up fast on what was happening in England in terms of policy changes, etc. And through that, they actually invited me to give a presentation of my experience of planning in Zambia. And that was great for two reasons. The first was, was that I didn't actually have to pay for my place to attend the summer school. So I saved a bit of money, which was great because I didn't have any. Uh, but also, more importantly, it looked really good on my CV. Uh, it's enabled me to put myself out there and show that I was really making an effort to catch up with what was happening and stay relevant to what was happening. I also made sure that I met up with old contacts, old colleagues that I used to work with, people that I used to know through my job, just to find out what was happening in the world of planning, what's changed, what's new, what's still the same. And I also made new contacts as well. Prime example at the planning summer school. I did a heck of a lot of reading because a lot had happened during that time. And I it was a long time of reading. But I also made sure that I focused on my volunteering as well, because it enabled me to to kind of work at the coalface, so to speak. So it was from all of that hard work, I applied for lots of jobs and I secured a job at ACOM in London and worked there for a couple of years and then followed on to a couple of years at DP9, a planning consultancy. And then, as we say, moved across to the other side of the table, uh, client side to working for St George. So it's been a bit of a roller coaster. As I said, there have been some highs, but there have also been some lows. And so how would I summarise my, my tips for navigating through a difficult time like this? So I've summarised them for you. And there's a handout that you can download to take these with you if you find them helpful. So that is, you need to stay relevant. Keep up to date with current and emerging trends, developments, changes in policy, et cetera, particularly pertinent given the current circumstances and the, the changes that we see happening. Use your contacts. So lean on your network to keep up to date and find out if there are any opportunities around, as Sam suggested. Raise your profile if you can. So, for example, when I attended the, the planning summer school and also presented as well, what that can do is that it can put you in front of key people within the industry and you never know what that's going to lead to. Look for opportunities, as Sam was saying as well. For me, I found the work experience and volunteering worked really well. But the main thing is, is that this is going to help you gain knowledge and experience. Because whilst you might not have a formal day to day of nine to five job, it's all counting. Stay focused on what you want to achieve. So you might have a particular interest in a certain sector or an area of planning, and that's where you want to work. It's always good to get experience, a broad experience at the beginning of your career, I would say. But just try to make sure that whatever it is that you're doing counts towards where you want to be. 
it might not seem a logical step to take on a particular volunteering role or to take on a job, but if you can look to see how that helps to build your career, it just means that you can stay on track during these really challenging times. And then the final point is hard work and patience. Again, as Sam said, it's times like this are really tough and you will get through it and it won't last forever but it does take a hard a lot of hard work and patience to navigate through through this kind of experience and that experience can be whether you're on furlough whether you've been made redundant maybe there's a threat of redundancy or you're trying to get your first job but it is hard but work hard, be patient, and when you come out the other side, you will absolutely be stronger for it. Thanks, Ginny. That was great. Um, for someone that's um, done a lot of volunteering work in the past, um, I would echo your um, your thoughts there, um, particularly the stay relevant bit. I think um, for me, I've always worked in consultancy, and what I enjoy the most about volunteering for organisations like the RTPI, and I have been a volunteer for Planning Aid in the past, is that I got to work with people from a public sector background that I wouldn't necessarily be able to mm. work and collaborate with during consultancy um, traditionally. So that was quite nice to get different perspectives and to learn and like, you know, stay relevant, build your contacts from different sectors. It's, um, it's a really good um, thing to do. I think now's probably a good time to um, do a plug for um, the RTPI London. Uh, we currently have um, our non nominations open for our committee and um, they close on Monday. We are looking for volunteers um, to support our regional activities committee and, and we have some roles on the regional management board as well. Um, so we can send round um, a link to those nomination forms online um, after the event, um, but I would um, ask everybody to take a look at them if you're interested in any volunteering. Um, the Regional Activities Committee get to plan all of these events and these webinars, um, and you get to come up with topics um, and help find speakers, and it's a really good way of um, getting involved um, in things like this. So if you're interested, um, please do so before Monday. Um, Great, I'll, I'll introduce our final speaker, which hopefully everybody um, knows well. Um, but our final speaker is Victoria Hills. She is the Chief, Chief Executive of the RTPI. And Victoria has over 22 years um, in senior planning roles. Um, and before joining the RTPI, led the UK's largest regeneration scheme at Old Oak Common. Um, as part of the RTPI, she is driving forward the delivery of our corporate strategy, uh, focusing on raising the profile of planning and promoting a diverse and inclusive profession. Um, thank you, Victoria. Great, thank you very much, um, Katie. And it, it, that was a great plug, actually, because in case I forget to mention it later, uh, nearly 20 years ago, I was on the RMB, and uh, when I was uh, first in London, so I. I I, I'm still in touch with many of the planners that I met nearly 20 years ago. Um, I, I, some of them I might sort of class sort of friends, actually, and uh, perhaps we'll come back to that uh, point. But thank you for the opportunity to say a little bit about my career path. Um, but also, I think I've been asked to say a little bit about um, uh, not just what led me to the RTPI, but more recent times in terms of what it's like working from home and all the, all the bits and pieces that go with that. If I did have a slide deck, uh, which I don't, um, I, um, perhaps uh, you'll, it will become clearer to you why I uh, haven't had time to uh, prepare that. But if I did have one, I would say um, the title of it would be something like, you're always where you're meant to be. Um, because uh, after I finished my A-levels, I thought I, I wasn't going to where I was meant to be uh, because uh, I actually didn't do as well in my A-levels as, as I wanted to. So all these fantastic geography courses that I had places at, um, it's a little known secret, well it was a little known until now, I couldn't take any of the places up, uh, so I was absolutely devastated that where I ended up doing geography was not where I wanted to do geography, um, but actually it was exactly where I was meant to be, because A, it turned out to be a fantastic course, um, shameless plug here for University of Wolverhampton, uh, B, many of the people I met there are still lifelong friends. Um, now around the world and uh, C, um, I was offered the opportunity to do a 12-week placement in a planning department and so I thought well why not um, in, in lieu of another module 
and uh, that was at uh, Dudley Metropolitan Borough Council, as I believe it still is. And I spent 12 weeks there, and I thought, yep, that's what I want to do. I want to be a planner. Uh, I took a year out um, working, uh, funnily enough, at, at Gatwick Airport. It seems a lifetime ago, uh, but uh, I enjoyed that so much because I got promoted when I was there, and I really thought, well, actually, I'll, I'll put that planning to one side now because. You know, I've got a car, I've got money, I've got friends. Why on earth would I want to leave all of this? And my father reminded me that uh, I had this place then at uh, Newcastle University, and that's really where I should go. So I'll always be thankful to him for that advice because I did my my two year masters up there, um, which was a phenomenal experience, really a real privilege to do it. But I worked throughout that masters um, to to pay for it, uh, to pay to eat, um, because obviously it's, it wasn't it wasn't free. And um, one of the things that we'll carry on going through, uh, it, uh, touching on in, in what I'm going to say is the networking, actually, because during my time up there, because I'd learned how to type at school, it meant that I could earn more because I could be a legal secretary. Um, and so unbeknownst to me, I got placed at a little law firm down the quayside called Dickinson Dees. And I was working for one of the construction partners and uh, the planning department were next door. So one of the planning lawyers I met there over 22 years ago. I'm still in touch with her now. I won't mention her, but she works with Pinson's now. So talk about a small world and, and networking. You never know who you're going to meet and how it will be helpful to you. Because um, she helped me then with some advice. Um, she'd already was in her early stage of her career. I wasn't yet. Um, but I, I, uh, I, I, I decided um, you know, where I wanted to start my career. And that the thing that fascinated me uh, was how things got done and who held the power. So I knew I wanted to go into local government. I knew I wanted to stay in the northeast, but sadly that wasn't to 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 pass um, because um, I've I've uh, you know not always got the jobs I wanted to get. Um, I went for a job at uh, Newcastle City Airport and I didn't get it. I was absolutely devastated. But I did get a job down at Wickham District Council in Buckinghamshire. And that uh, was a really good choice. It enabled me to do some top-up modules at Oxford Brooks. I don't think uh, Ginny and I met when I was there, but but I did some study there. And, and it was the people that I met there um, that, that really uh, helped point me in a, a direction of, of uh, my next move, which I knew that I, I wanted to get to London at some point. Um, and I wanted to experience the private sector. So I was very fortunate because it was, it was um, it was pre uh, that recession that's been mentioned a couple of times. Um, at, at the time, I should say, I started my career in 1998, the day that John Prescott published a new deal for transport, and my specialism was transport planning. Uh, well, you can imagine, um, you know, the world was awash of money for all things uh, transport, and so it was easy to get a job in consultancy in London, and that was my second move. And I was absolutely loving that job because it took me all around the country. And uh, it, it was a great opportunity, but I had this nagging uh, feeling that there was something more exciting going on in City Hall down the road because uh, this new mayor was getting devolution powers. Um, he was getting money and he was setting up something called Transport for London. And I remember having a conversation once with one of my sister's very matter of frank uh, Norwegian friends saying, you know, I'd, I'd love to go and work for the mayor. And she said, why don't you then? Um, and of course, well, OK, um, I'll make it happen. Well, thankfully, an opportunity came up, actually, and um, and I went for it. And I never thought I'd uh, I never thought I'd get it, but I did. I went into the mayor's transport team. I ended up spending 16 years there, all three mayors. Um, and uh, and and actually, it sounds like a, a very long time, uh, but I had uh, eight different jobs in those three years. Um, and I'll, I'll come on to some advice tips in a moment, but I'm just answering the question of what led me to the RTPI. Um, and, you know, as, as things went on, there were opportunities um, and uh, very fortunate that London won the Olympics at that time. There were opportunities to move sideways into city operations, then move back to lead my old team. Um, and then there was HS2, which started to unlock other opportunities. And, uh, and so I ended up um, moving across, set up a development corporation, uh, which was a phenomenal experience and a job that I very much love. Um, and I ended up getting headhunted for the job I'm doing now. And um, I, I immediately dismissed it. Why on earth would I want to run a membership body? Uh, I'm, I'm running a project here. I don't want to run a membership body. But actually, the more I looked into it, I realised there's a bit more to it than that. And I now in, in, consider myself in, extremely privileged 
Um, and there's some luck in there, but there's also about being in the right place and um, a whole heap other, of other stuff, perhaps we'll get to in the questions, that, uh, that led me to where I am now. Um, because it is quite an unusual route in some respects, but then I, I actually genuinely believe that I am where I'm meant to be now. And I'm, I'm having a, a great time doing the job, um, but it won't be what I do forever. And there'll be something else um, after, after this one. So it was um, interesting to hear um, reflections of our other two fantastic uh, panellists here talking about the, the breaks, but also the knocks, because for anyone um, listening to this uh, under uh, the, the impression that I've had an easy ride of it, so I just want to dispel that one uh, straight away. Let, uh, just focusing on the, the knocks, if you like, there've been lots of jobs that I've really put my heart and soul into and got down to the last one, uh, sorry, the last two, or, or the last five, because some of the big jobs, um, they, you know, it's, it's down to the last five. And um, but actually, as knocked as I felt, I've I've learned to grow to realise that that wasn't the right job for me. And look at that as a positive experience of the process that I went through and the skills and opportunities that I learned in going through that was was really, uh, really good. Um, I've had a, a fair few challenging times through throughout my uh, career. I spent nine nine months trying to run a development corporation without a chair that was that was pretty challenging um, but I think probably one step before that uh, was actually trying to set up a, a development corporation with a seven-month-old baby it was particularly challenging um, but one of the things I've learned is you just sort of take one day at a time if you think about the enormity of, of what sits in front of you at times it might be enough to send you a bit stir crazy, um, or the opposite of, of stir crazy but but it's uh, but actually just one one day one day at a time. Um, so, uh, but I've also been very, uh, very lucky that I've had opportunities. And, and Sam was saying about people tucking you in the shoulder. I strongly think there is an opportunity for you to make your own luck because you've got to put yourself in the position where you meet people and you can have conversations. Now, this is a theme throughout my entire career, and it started right out as a student, actually. Um, I was the one who put my hand up at Newcastle University and said, when the RTPI came to speak to us, yes, I'd like to be the student representative, please, on your RMB. Um, and, and the person who drove me to those meetings, because they were out in the middle of nowhere, um, we, we went on to be a president of the RTPI, and we've been uh, in touch for, for forever, ever since. Um, and I, I, I had the opportunity through that to get involved in organising the Young Planners Conference up in Newcastle. And that then led me to go on to the Young Planners uh, panel, which I ended up chairing from 2000 to 2002. Um, I, and I also sat on council at the RTPI. It's, it's kind of weird I'm running this organisation now that I've got so actively involved in. But why am I telling you that? Well, it was the connections, the exposure, the networks that I developed over 20 years ago. It's still relevant for me now. Um, and I always took myself out of my comfort zone in doing so and talking to people of a different generation almost speaking a different language at times um but but taking what i could to learn from them to figure out you know what was going on and how it all fitted together um and so my advice uh, one of my pieces of advice is to volunteer as much as you can when you have the time in your younger part of your career because you never know when these connections or people that you speak to are going to be helpful to you you can call in a favour. People call in favours off of me all the time. People I haven't met for years because obviously you know, the, the, the brilliance of LinkedIn and all sorts is just, you know, people, you're a lot more accessible now than you would have been uh, back in the older days. And, and actually, um, you know, this isn't an old boys network. This is what I call kind of a new world network. Um, there's nothing wrong with going out and meeting people and finding out, you know, what they're up to and you know, and, and staying in touch because it's never done me any harm to create those networks. And I've continued to do it to this day, even in my professional career now, where I have less time to volunteer um, at the RTPI. I've always gone beyond the usual suspects. And, you know, just this morning, I'm with the Construction Leadership Council or working with the engineers. Um, think broader than your bubble and take yourself out of your um, comfort zone. Now, moving on to some of the questions that I've been asked to hear about what's it been like recently working from home um, and impact things like homeschooling well i think some of the challenging things that i've had to deal with in my career before uh, meant that uh, I, the, the kind of going into the pandemic um, taking the organization forward being very calm and having a clear plan 
these were things that to more or less I took in my stride. I mean, clearly there is a, a certain element of uh, adrenaline in, in, as we went into lockdown, but that was all fine. I, I could take all of that. I, I've had more challenging things to deal with earlier in my career in some respects. Um, uh, and uh, and so that kind of not so much numbs you, but means that you're, you're tough and you, you can deal with these things. But I can honestly say the most challenging thing for me personally, everybody has their points everybody and for me homeschooling was the one that pushed me over the edge honestly in those early days of lockdown i can handle running an organization from home i can handle the insecurity of not knowing what the heck's going on but having to find another four hours a day times two because i've got two kids at primary school age was quite frankly very difficult um and uh, i personally feel feel this isn't a political thing but i personally feel a bit let down that the government was so slow to come up with an action an action plan to find a way to to school our children safely because the pressure that that's put on anybody with children has been for me personally it's my my pinch point phenomenally hard and i would say one of the hardest things that i've had to deal with in my career actually um but you know we've got to the summer holidays um and uh, and, and the good news is some of the clubs are opening up again now which is fine um, and so kind of the world moves on. Um, so everybody has their pinch point, the thing that kind of pushes them over the edge. I guess my advice to you is working out which one is yours and coming up with a, a strategy to deal with it. And for me, it was just getting up bloody early in the morning and getting English and maths done before the course started at nine o'clock, um, which might seem like a crazy thing to do. Excuse me, the, uh, the rubbish men are here, obviously on cue, just as I'm doing a webinar. Um, and so, um, yeah, that that's kind of where, where, where that that's kind of it in a, in, a, in terms of how it's been. Um, I'm just trying to think now in terms of other bits of careers advice I, I would give really, and I've jotted down a couple of bits here. I, I completely agree with the other panelists. You've got to enjoy what you do. Um, if you don't, there's no point moaning and whinging about it. Go and do something else because trust me, life is too short. And, you know, I, I may still feel like I'm 22, but I'm not. I'm well into my 40s now. And I'm like, how the heck did I get here? I don't know. I've just been working really hard, I guess. Um, uh, num number two here is uh, there are no there are no shortcuts. OK, so hard work. If you want to do well, you're going to have to work hard. But hard work alone is not enough. You've got to make the connections. You have to have a little bit of luck. But as I said, you can create that luck through making the connections. Um, and you have to invest in yourself, um, uh, you know, whether that's your development or what it is that, that you need. Um, and number three is really be authentic. And, um, and if you are trying to be somebody that you're actually not, A, you won't be very happy, B, you will get found out. So just genuinely be yourself. And that's a way of dealing with the knocks. When I went for a couple of big jobs not too long ago, um, certainly not in the scheme of things, um, over the course of the last five years, I you know i dealt with that by thinking well i wasn't right for that job because it, you know that was me in the room and that didn't fit what they wanted so that was that was the right thing so being true to yourself and being really authentic um and yeah i would say overall my biggest uh, achievement my biggest career achievement without doubt is being able to have two children and still hold down a, a full-time job um, and be able to uh, move it and, and do really exciting things that that I have been able to do. It's not easy. Um, it is hard work, but if you love what you do, um, then what's not to like? So, you know, if I was, if you're young watching this, volunteer as much as you can, because I hear it from students all the time. I'm really, really busy. I say, I know you are, but trust me, you've got so much more time now than you will have you when you're my age. And I'm not saying in a patronizing way, but, um, and they don't believe me. I'm like, trust me, you'll never have so much time in your life, honestly. Um, and there are times where I think I haven't got literally a second to myself, uh, which is why I didn't join my fantastic panelists for a pre brief, because I didn't. Um, and it's why I haven't got a slide deck today. Uh, but my final point is sometimes good enough is just good enough. I had to get out of my comfort zone that I'm not going to be able to be perfect uh, in, in my work all the time. I'm not going to be able to answer all the emails, not if I want to have two happy kids at home um, and, uh, and and try not to get divorced in the, in the process. So actually, sometimes good enough is just good enough. Um, so I hope that's helped to inspire some of you.
Um, and I loved the song collection earlier. I've been keeping a note of my own favourite songs in, in, the, in the lockdown. I think that's, uh, that's really good fun. So back to you, Katie. Thank you, Victoria. And that was really um, interesting. Um, so we have um, about five minutes for questions, so not a huge amount of time, but we have had some things come through. Um, question to all the panellists, um, what are your tips for expanding your network in the current context of working from home and being less able to meet people? I mean, it's been a key theme for, from all of your um, presentations. Have you got any tips? Just a quick one for me. If you're joining a webinar, make sure people know you're there. So ask a question um, because it's all about profile and, and, and being visible and present. That's just a quick one for me. Ginny, yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, um, there, there are opportunities out there. So, for example, planning aid, you can you can provide advice whilst you're sat at your desk. I've done it numerous times whilst I'm trying to fend off work emails. Um, also, as well, uh, events like this really, really help. So, whilst I was out in Zambia, I was still attending a conference, a worldwide conference that counted. So, it's not always about seeing people face to face. Yes, it's great, but there are opportunities out there. You just got to, you've just got to find them, and they will work for you. Uh, sorry, it's very remiss of me, um, but you should all obviously consider applying for election of the RTPI because um, even if you don't get elected, we're going to give you loads of free publicity on our website and all the comms that we send out over the course of uh, the next mm. month or so. So, you know, get get throw your hat in the ring. Yeah, and um, I, I was just going to add that it's a, a, a big committee. We've been having our uh, meetings. Um, over video conference, so you're still getting to meet people, um, speak to people, um, even if it's not face to face. Um, and we are exploring ways of how we might be able to do a bit more one on one networking um, next year, maybe when things start opening up a little bit again. But yeah, I agree. Join, say yes to everything. That's my motto. Join every committee going, <laughs> make your face known. <laughs> Uh, Sam, have you got anything you'd like to add to that, or shall we move on to a poll? Um, I, I probably, so, in, in so far as I mean, expanding networks, yes. Um, but I, I'd also, um, I'd also highlight the importance of just maintaining your uh, your existing net. You know, the people that you do you do know. Um, Victoria made the point that you know she's still in touch and benefiting from the relationships that that, that she started you know 20 20 plus years ago and that is the case that is your career you the, the people that you're you're meeting and interacting with early in your career um, you all you know graduate through different you know maybe at different paces but you all graduate through your career together and i've been working in the northwest long enough now that i've known some people for as long as i've known my university friends and you know those those work con contacts become initially become become your become your friends and so you might not be having the same level of um uh, you know face-to-face -face interaction but i would say and, I've, and what's trying to get what's kept me going is is trying to have that same interaction um remotely so where you might have had a meeting and have half an hour and call in and see somebody just text them and say you know should we have a virtual cup of tea at half past four or you know if you know somebody likes something um, you know, somebody likes um, a band or a sport or something. So I'm watching this. Are you watching it? Come on, I'll put it on and well, you know, watch it together. Because I think the important thing about, um, well, for, certainly from a consultancy point of view, you know, 80% that's 80 of your fee income comes from repeat business. So I think often sometimes maybe too much is stated about expanding your network and getting in new clients. If you're in that's you know, if you're in the, in the product side. If your focus as a consultant should be to keep your existing clients happy and the corollary of, of that is to you know just stay close to the people that you do know and maybe through that you know you get to um meet other people yeah I, I, would, I would just add that you know there will be all sorts of calls for giving evidence or joining this committee or you know all sorts of things that you may previously have thought I, I haven't got time for that or you know but actually in the, in, if we're working more virtually like this maybe maybe you have got time for it and uh, I, what, one of the uh, stories I forgot, forgot to share was one of the young planners who I sat with on the young planners panel with over 20 years ago I won't name him because he's a planning consultant in the West Midlands um, 
but he's godfather to my son. Um, and that, those sorts of networks, um, it is, it, they, it's more than just work colleagues because it, this is a, it's not just a job, it's a vocation planning. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's people that you meet, you just never know when you're going to keep bumping into them again. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, find other ways to network and, and use social media as well. Great, thank you everyone. I think that's a great point to end on actually. Um, so um, we are at half one, so we will close the webinar. Um, I know we can't thank you all in the traditional way, um, but on behalf of uh, the RTPI London, and I'm sure all of our listeners, and um, thank you very much for joining the webinar today and for all of your tips and pointers. And they've been very helpful to me, so I'm sure they've been very helpful to our listeners as well. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.